Admiral James Stavridis, retired United States Navy, former Allied Supreme Commander, former head of Southern Command, joins us. Good morning, Admiral. How are you? Doing great, Hugh. I'm right here in the nation's capital today. Oh, what? You know, we missed. I intend to have you over to the house at some point because I got like a stack of 50 books for you to sign from various people, but we miss. I'm up north. What is it, 130 degrees there today? I think it's going to be a cool day, probably 119. There you go. Uh, Admiral, you have had a chance to read the Vivek Ramaswamy transcript yesterday. Uh, Before I go to any specifics, your reaction. Um, Well, I think there's a lot to like about the idea of uh, new innovative candidates that no one's heard of who have a successful track record in an entirely different field than politics. And that kind of applies to Vivek. And that's why there's some buzz out there. On what I read on that transcript, I think he's wrong in a number of significant dimensions um, because I think it's, it's too transactional in his approach to China effectively, as I read it, effectively using Taiwan as a kind of, uh, a kind of bargaining chip that we would ultimately discard. You can kind of do that in business with a portfolio company. You buy, you hold it, you get rid of it. You don't do that with allies, partners, and friends. And when you do that once, you send a shockwave through the whole system. How do you think that interview would be received in Seoul, Korea, or Tokyo, Japan, or Canberra, Australia? Answer, not very well. Well, I did ask him about that. And his response was, they obviously would like us to say something else, but it's not in our national interest. I did get one response from a, uh, a very savvy person who said, does he realize that if you turn over Taiwan, you're turning over the strait? And the strait, and not only that, the first island in the first island chain. What does that matter geopolitically? It matters enormously. And so geography is something you can't change. You can't buy your way out of geography. And your uh, commentator is exactly right. Taiwan guards, it's not just the strait. It guards the entire South China Sea. And the South China Sea, Hugh, as you realize, is half the size of the continental United States, and China claims it entirely as territorial waters. So to turn over Taiwan, you're effectively, think of it, that's the tower guarding the north uh, in Game of Thrones terms. You don't want to give that away. And by the way, it's not just the geography that's a pragmatic factor here. You ought to look at the economics of Taiwan. This is 23 million people, quite a small population. Here's the punchline. It's the 19th largest economy in the world. It's an engine. It's one of the four tigers of Southeast Asia. Um, You don't want to just flip that over to the Chinese Communist Party, in my view. So there's geography and the military aspect. There's the economics. And as we set up front, philosophically, you don't want to be in a position of using allies, partners, and friends as bargaining chips that you throw back onto the table when you're kind of done with them. Now, Admiral, I'm, I'm very interested in what you think the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they'll translate this, they'll summarize it, they'll give it to Xi Jinping and the Foreign Affairs Secretary Wang and others. What do you think they'll think of this if they assess Vivek's chances of becoming president at not zero, which is it's got to be not zero, right? It's, he's not not zero. So you and I are zero. Uh, we're not running. But he is running, and he's at 6% and 10% and 11%, so he's not zero. What do they say about it? Um, I think they put him in a category of, hmm, uh, young, bright, energetic, someone we could uh, have a conversation with about China. And if you put his theory that you've just described kind of hold them and fold them when you're done with them, Um, you know, compared to what's coming out from the other candidates. If you're in Beijing, um, Vivek looks like someone, yeah, I want to have a conversation. Let's recall uh, all of the statements, even the tiniest ones dealing with China from all of those candidates across that Republican field are being carefully transcribed, winnowed. They will watch this process closely and newsflash so will the rest of the world. Believe me, the Europeans are listening when they hear that conversation. And if you're in Estonia, another tiny little country that punches way above its weight economically and is located on a crucial piece of real estate, 
if you're in Estonia and you hear that storyline, you think, hmm, I wonder if we get traded away at the end of the day, like a portfolio company that no longer needs to be part of my portfolio. Now, if you were on the uh, stage with Brett Baer and uh, others uh, on the Fox News debate in two weeks, how much time would you give to national security issues like those I discussed with Vivek yesterday? And how much would you give to domestic policy like the indictments of former President Trump? Yeah, I would say um, what's happening domestically ought to be the strong driver of the conversation. And it begins with uh, the legal challenges of the former president. I think that's a significant topic. But I think much more significant than that are what's happening with our economy, what's happening with our chip manufacturing base, what's happening with trade flows, what's happening with interest rates, inflation. I think that package, let's call that the domestic agenda, ought to be three quarters of the conversation because that's what Americans tune in to learn about. Um, I think one quarter ought to be on national security, international events. I'll tell you what I think the percentages will be. I would guess it'll be well less than 10%. It'll be five to 10% on those national products, uh, international products. And that's a shame because believe me, we may not be interested in the world, but the world is interested in us. And they are- Now, following- Admiral, you're a fine writer. I don't know how much time you have a chance to read books that have just come out, but this one just came out. It's called Cobble by Jerry Dunlavy and James Hassan, a detailed uh, TikTok of what happened two years ago today, the fall of Kabul and what followed, and the consequences both in Russia and China. Have you had a chance to read it yet? I have not. It is on my stack, and I look forward to reading it because I think the, the entire episode deserves very close scrutiny. It, I have never been more angry. And I, I thought I knew the story. I don't know the story. Uh, and there was quite a lot of deceiving, quite a lot of incompetence, quite a lot of, of blown calls and missed stuff. Two years out, what is the lesson the world takes from our actions in Kabul two years ago? Yeah, I think the first and most obvious one is you question whether the U.S. is a reliable ally, partner, and friend. That's, that's fundamental, and you can't deny that wherever you are on the political spectrum. I hope that the book also examines other factors that went into this collapse. There is a military piece of this. How did the U.S. Department of Defense do? Answer, frankly, not very well. Um, How did the intelligence community do? Answer, pretty well from what I can see in terms of getting their people out, less well in terms of analyzing what was coming. Number three, I hope the book looks at the Taliban. We need to understand this story from the Taliban perspective. We ought to credit them and understand what they did to defeat us. And then fourth and finally, I hope it examines the monstrous failure of the senior Afghan, starting with President Ashraf Ghani, who, unlike Volodymyr Zelensky, who heroically stayed and rallied the defenses, uh, Ashraf Ghani hopped on a helicopter with a bag of cash and made it out to Dubai. Point being, Hugh, there's plenty of blame to go around here. I'm all about examining all that blame, taking the lesson. I'll conclude where I started. The world sees it as a failure of the U.S., as an ally, as a partner, as a friend. We've got work to do to dig out from that. It's all there, all of it. And I do want to add one final thing. You're very proud at the end of this, especially if you're a warrior like you, of the men and women who were on the ground. Uh, Not just the 11 Marines who died and the corpsman who died and the Army sergeant who died, but we had special operators in the streets of Kabul every night, which I did not know about. Uh, We had the CIA there who saved hundreds of people with their special operators. We had the Black Gate. We had other gates going. Yes, we lost 13 heroes at at Abbey Gate. But the the men and women on the ground, uh, they're just, it gives me shivers to think about what I read about them. And it's extraordinarily uh, moving how badly they were let down. I mean, they were really badly let down, Admiral. I'll I'll read the book and we can have another conversation about it. I want to add one other group that deserves praise, and those are veterans, Afghan veterans back in the United States who organized an enormous number 
of escapes and airlifts. And I was on the, the edges of that as the old retired four star making a couple of phone calls. There were veterans on the ground. There were veterans all over the world orchestrating, including the co-author of my book, 2034, Elliot Ackerman, an Afghan veteran, remarkable officer, um, one of thousands who orchestrated these escapes and are to be credited in that very dark hour. There is a chapter on, on that network that came together. There's also a chapter on the lone wolf that we knew, the known wolf who blew up Abbey Gate, and we did not take the shot. It's, it's really so disturbing, Admiral. I look forward to talking to you about it at length. James Stavridis, thank you, Admiral. Follow him at Stavridis J on the site, formerly known as Twitter, now known as X. He's still Stavridis J, and you still ought to follow what he has to say and what he thinks.